we have the system of us is what's called in Europe Euro 4, Euro 5 EEV, which is compared with CNG engines. Further, we for the Italian market, we have another version with overhead wires, as you can see here, but that's a special development for the Italian market. And next year, year we will start with a fuel cell project together with the city of Amsterdam. <coughs> It's a very, very lightweight body, and that has been developed, engineered, and designed by Fokker, who's known for the aircraft industry. Fokker is, you had, did use a lot of aircraft technology with the development of that body. The side panels are from polyester sandwich, and the roof and the floor are aluminum sandwich panels. And all, everything is bonded together, so no bolts, just bonding together. This also means that it has a long lifetime, low corrosion, and very stiff. Here you see a short uh, view of the production at Fokker, of the roof this is. These are panels from one meter, from five foot. And that also means that you are very flexible, so you can put the doors there where you want. Here you see the crash test. It's about uh, 20 miles an hour. And the scratch is just, uh, the final result on the body is just some scratches. So it's a very strong, very stiff body. Also very light, the weight of the 24 meter, that's the 80 foot, is only 4,500 kilos compared to a conventional built vehicle, which will be about 8,500 8 kilos. So a very lightweight and strong body. Then short electronic guidance. It's a very uh, difficult and very theoretical uh, uh, story. But in principle, I will say you can best, what you can do is to compare it with a robotic <coughs> system in a factory. You learn the robot to pick up something and put it somewhere else. And if you learn the robot that, you will repeat it millions and millions of times. In fact, we are doing the same. We are driving with the vehicle, the route, it has to drive. And in the wheels, all wheels have sensors which are measuring the rotation <coughs> of the wheels. At the same time, you're measuring the steering angle of each axle. This means altogether if you start at the zero point again and you push the button of the computers, that it will drive exactly the same route. Of course it's a little bit difficult in, in practice, but that's the principle. <coughs> what is the big difference compared to the robot in the factory? That's that the robot in the factory always has the same circumstances. But on the road things are changing. In winter time there can be leaves, on, there's no snow here, but there can maybe leaves on the road, so one wheel can slip. On the other side, if the vehicle is fully loaded, also the, the wheels are smaller. Also after 20,000 miles, 30,000 miles also, because of wear and tear, your tires get smaller. So what you need is a reference for the vehicle. And as reference, we, knew, we used, as shown here, just those small magnets, that's all. And they are embedded in the road every four meters, so every uh, 40 feet, something like that. The position of those magnets is also measured with an accuracy of about one or two, two millimeters. So that's uh, one tenth of an inch, something like that. The position of the magnets also is taken into the computer. And what you see here is this is the device which is measuring the position of those magnets. If it's measuring, uh, just look at and here you see the measurements of the magnets. Yeah, all north, north, south, north, south, north. And if it's measuring a, a difference to the, uh, to the <coughs> position it has in the computer, then it's just correcting back to the zero position again. And that's I think the, the basis of the safety of the vehicle. Also, it's so that every axle is separately <coughs> controlled. So it's not that one axle is controlled, and that's because of that all the other axles are controlled. No, every axle is con controlled separately, <coughs> and each axle has three computers, just like an airplane. So the computers are controlling each other, and that's in principle the base of the safety of the vehicle. If you have an electronic guidance and you can steer every wheel, that gives you the possibility to program the computer that when it is going to stop, to enter a stop, that then the 
it can turn like it's shown here below, all the wheels in the same direction. That means that you go parallel to a bus stop or to a platform and it enables us to uh, stop within the distance of two inches of the whole length of the vehicle, so completely parallel to the stop. Here you see it, just a, a short uh, video of the test track where we have been testing the guidance system and you see the side movement of the vehicle, how it's moving to the side. Wow. And this, I still use this film even if it's already six yeah, or seven cool. years old because the movement of the vehicle is very big. You Normally you have our car. What? You have our car. <laughs> <laughs> Could be nice for parking. Yeah, really. yeah, really. <laughs> maybe, but maybe it's a little bit... <laughs> well, it's a very flexible vehicle. We are flexible in the route, so if the route has to change, because maybe in the beginning somebody made the wrong choice, it's very easy to change that. Also, if there would be a vehicle, if there would be an accident, it's very easy. The driver can take over to the steering wheel, pass the accident, and put it again on the virtual rail. In the guidance system, you have also uh, three modes. One is manual, which is also very flexible if you have a route to drive, and at the evening you have to go back to the garage or to the depot, so you take it off the, the, the guidance and you just drive to your depot. You have the half automatic mode, then you're driving it like a tram system, so the driver sticks still accelerating and braking, and you can drive it fully automatic, where the driver just has to push a button and it leaves the platform and it goes, stops at the next platform. The design is flexible, as already explained with the body. You can have doors on both sides, just like the train or tram or, or like rail system. <coughs> we have a fully flat floor, which means that also our customers have fully the freedom to make the seat layout they want. A lot of seats or just a few seats and a lot of standing places. And the big advantage I think is also the, what I already said, the maintenance workshop or the depot. We just take it in manual mode and drive it to the depot instead of having a very big expensive workshop to put in the trains every evening. These are the projects we are doing at the moment. Eindhoven is finished. We are uh, in Douai at this moment in the design phase. And we are starting also in Istanbul and Pescara in Italy at the moment. And with South Korea it's a license agreement where we sold our technology. Time's up, okay, next. It's almost finished. Because of the situation here in Honolulu, I went, went into my archive, archive and looked for maybe a project in the past for which we have been quoting. And I found a tender we did in Savona two years ago. We didn't get the contract because the tender was completely uh, cancelled. But there the track was about four miles. That's much less than here, but it's about the figures. It was two miles elevated, like you can see here. One mile was underground and one mile was on street level and the total uh, rotation of us and our uh, construction companies in Italy was about 60 million dollars which means about 15 million a mile wow. here we have some images of the platforms of the race platform and in combination also here with uh, parking space underground in combination with the station so to make sure for us environmentally friendly and an economic alternative for private light rail systems for capacitors between 2,000 and 6,000 people per hour per direction. And this is just an infrastructure, very short view how it works in the infrastructure. And that's it, I think. Who's next? So that's it. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> so wheelchairs can just go Yeah, they go on the same level and can go up very fast. That's one of the biggest fun. So this is any questions? Yes, any questions? Yes. Let's uh, start from the back. Yes. Okay. No, from the back. No, no, so um, flip that light on back of me, okay. Light, okay. Please. Thanks, Tom. Thank you, Jack. I have a question on Mr. Yarn. No chance. Go ahead. Yes. It's okay, it's okay. Sorry if I... Right, go ahead, Mr. Question. Your name is very important. So 
hopefully you'll pardon me. Never no problem, no problem. Never been to Holland, but one day I hope I get to Please put <laughs> <That's good laughs> the question. A um, couple of things. This magnet permits the driver to place the vehicle in automatic drive, and it will stop at the next stop. But would it require the operator to brake in case of human interference? If there's human interference and you have a course in the Netherlands very much because no, no bicycle is stopping for red uh, light, so he still has to watch very carefully what's happening. Also in the system in Eindhoven, the vehicle has only 85% 80, priority. That means that also he can have a situation where his light is red, so he has to brake one. If it's fully, aut fully automatic mode. I have two more questions. Number two, the test drive, you say it's six years ago, the sample you showed. Yes, that's an uh, example. Yeah. How many cities so far uses the Phineas vehicle? It's uh, driving now only in Eindhoven, and we are in the execution of the contracts we have up the moment. So it's only driving in Eindhoven at the moment. What is the population? Population of Eindhoven is 110,000, and the region for which it's, it's used is 700,000. Third and final question. Uh, Technology is new, however, are you folks part of a, another, like, are you a subsidiary of a larger company? Yes, we are part of the VDL group. And the VDL elected officials in 2005, we have one elected official here, Rep. Rita Cabanilla, who voted for a tax increase so we could even discuss this. We're in a transportation crisis, and we have a very bold legislator here, so I want to thank you, Rep. Cabanilla, for following through. Number two, ridership. The pictures that you showed were very comfortable. Mm -hmm. The carry capacity that, that has been brought forward, we have a councilwoman by the name of Ann Kobayashi that in, a, in an op-ed piece a few days ago talked about carrying capacity and speed. If we look at carrying capacity, your schemata needed to be like sardines. Your schemata was very comfortable, very welcoming. So if we look at the comparisons between, between what you're proposing and what, from my understanding, what's being proposed by this administration are very two different... What's the question? Okay, hey, question, hey, hey, number hey, three. Tom, wait, what's the question? Question, on the, uh, on the uh, emergency evacuation, what would it be under your schemata of proposal if that Honolulu were under a tsunami warning or a <laughs> earthquake? How could your design accommodate Honolulu for emergency evacuation on rubber tire technology? <laughs> I don't have the answer on that. You have the this, is, uh, this system is operated in the fixed guideway. Obviously, in time of a crisis, that fixed guideway can be inoperable at all. In that case, we can turn all, all vehicles into the manual mode and this, this can be uh, uh, supplied by their own self-contained uh, in internal combustion engine. So it can be drive like regular bus and carrying a lot more capacity. And also, this is very lightweighted, actually 40% to 60% lighter than regular bus we are having today on the road. Maybe we can go into the area uh, uh, not stable <coughs> enough for the regular bus or trucks or evacuation vehicle can go. Because in that situation, I think the uh, pavement or the structure will be a lot weaker than the, what has been designed. Okay. Yes. Any other questions? We have comments. Oh. OK. OK, my name is Ken Levesque, called the neighborhood board. About nine years ago, I presented something like this to DTS. And I added stuff, OK? They were looking at mass transit. They wanted to go, we want to go from Nanakuli to Waikiki and back. You can turn these things around. I used road trains from Australia. I had a uh, pamphlet and everything from Australia on this. The point is, you can demonstrate ridership without ever making an elevated guideway by using um, escort vehicles on predetermined courses that allow you to do ex speeds faster than normal you can synchronize all your lights so you don't have to stop for stoplights, okay? This kind of an approach can totally
totally bypass the needs for an elevated structure and show you can have ridership that would then justify an elevated structure. These types of vehicles could be used as a demonstration project that then allows you to share all the money that you need for, and, and the investment and the inconvenience to the population. Okay, it's, you, you guys are, this is okay. something very seriously that needs to be looked at. Okay, any, all right. Right. You know, one, one comment that uh, Council Member Kobayashi mentioned, 80 miles per hour, I believe that's 80 kilometers per hour. Oh, well, we, the hour. top speed of the vehicle can be 120 kilometers, so that's about 80, almost 80 miles an hour. But for public transport, we will limit it also in, in Europe up to 90 kilometers, so it's about 60, 65 miles an hour. And uh, the question is, you mentioned the capacity, 2,000 to 6,000 people per hour. What would it take to increase that to the level we need to? What level do we need? Well, the uh, alternatives analysis indicated 131,000, I believe, riders per day. This is that's a lot on the rail system. That's in peak hours. Is that that's said to 13,000 people per hour in peak? That's what if you they, have a total day. To that's total what they claim. I'm just asking what capacity. <laughs> what would it take to reach that sort of capacity with the Achilles? It is possible, but that uh, should be a very special uh, solution. Then you have to develop, which is possible with the guidance system, platooning, which means that two vehicles are driving electronically coupled to each other. But that's a development. We know that it's possible, but still we have not uh, put any effort in that. But I think it's very, very much uh, 30,000 an hour. Scott? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <coughs> One of the general objections of a hybrid bus uh, fixed guideway system is going to be the long uh, approach ramps. Could Do you have now, or at some point, do you expect to have some diagrams <clears throat> excuse me, so that we might better visualize the approach ramps so that a bus in this scenario could, for instance, as it comes from the EVA community and, and ascends to the fixed guideway? Um, that, that would be very interesting to have. And secondly, how deeply must the magnets be buried uh, in the construction process? And the, the magnets are uh, covered by just one-fifth of an inch of two component glue. They're just below the, the surface. And the gradient we can go up fully loaded with the 26 meters, so with the 85 foot, is 18 percent. So it's a very steep hill we can do. Excellent, excellent. But that's fully loaded. May I respond to that? Oh, go ahead. Okay, I'm sorry. First, uh, the gentleman mentioned about the demo program. That's actually the Israel, and uh, they are in process, uh, we're in process making a prototype vehicle for that. So that's been exercised in, in this configuration already. And the ramp, uh, ramp is just the driveway up to the fixed of course. driveway. And we have 18% uh, great ability, which means we could be as long as 50 feet. You know, you can, we can actually drive Sierra Drive no problem with a full, fully loaded. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. I had, yeah, I had several questions. Uh, first, in regarding the ridership, how many, how many of these vehicles were being considered in order to achieve that ridership of 2,000 passengers per hour? In Eindhoven, the number of ridership is much lower. It's, and had the frequency driving there is uh, apparently seven and a half minutes, apparently 50 minutes. But for Turkey, the ridership will be about uh, 8,000 people per hour. So <coughs> this, there we drive, we'll have to drive. We will deliver the first vehicles that are beginning next year. There we have to drive at a frequency of uh, one, uh, one and a half minute. So we're driving very fast. Yeah. So to achieve that, how many vehicles? There they have for a track of 20 kilometers, so that's about 50. 30 miles, they have about 50 vehicles. So it's roughly similar to Honolulu, you have about 50 vehicles already achieved that so it's 2000. Okay. Uh, just your name, please. Joe Francher, Wahi well, Wildlife. Well, okay. Thank uh, you. My second question was uh, regarding what Mr. Lee said. The level four safety and security certification is issued by who? Uh, the, the French the government. government. French government. <laughs> no, no, no. FTA is also <coughs> it's, a, it's like ISO but, 9000. But it's, you know, it's much higher. But the, in Europe, you uh, get European uh, regulations. 
We make regulations, but it takes all this <coughs> between three, four, maybe sometimes seven, eight years before all the countries accept <coughs> those regulations. And France is one of the first countries in Europe who accepted the safety uh, regulations which are made by the European U Union, just so principled by European regulations. Okay, question. Yeah, Carl Jacobs, uh, IA Neighborhood Board, uh, also the um, uh, Amman, uh, the Kamehameha uh, Highway Task Force. You want to stay there? Yeah, <coughs> sorry to be a little bit late. Uh, it took me an hour and 40 minutes <laughs> <laughs> to get here from New Blaisdell Park. See, <laughs> 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 via the bus. <laughs> uh, question is um, uh, regarding radio frequency interference, uh, RFI. Uh, have there been any issues? All those tests have been executed according to the European regulations, and no problems at all. Okay, okay, because that's that, that's a major corridor for uh, uh, telecommunications and and, and power. Uh, There's no problem. At all. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much. I think <laughs> no, well, we have to move on. Yes. Uh, Senator, I had a question. Uh, I forgot to include that. All right, go ahead, quick. Uh, Senator? Yeah, Councilmember uh, now. <laughs> yeah, Councilman. <laughs> well, uh, I was a senator. <laughs> ways and means, uh -huh. budget. Anyway, uh, I have a question yes. about the mayor's proposal to have engineers or planners to study the technology. Mm -hmm. oh, excuse me. I think uh, we should keep to this subject. No. And I just want to be it, it, it knowing. Is, it's in the subject, Chairman. I'm trying to get, uh, yeah, we're trying to get, there's a lot of gender on this, a lot of things on the agenda. I realize that. So why don't you uh, ask that question afterwards? Well, uh, and I need a public answer. That's the reason why I'm asking a public answer. Okay, answer. okay, hurry up. <laughs> Is the mayor's proposal originally a four, and <coughs> the possibility of that changing to five? Do you anticipate these technologies being included in a committee study? and to be proposed to the council for adoption? I, I don't, because what is the reason for the panel? We've had a law on the books for nearly a year that says that the council will make that selection, will make that decision. And all of a sudden, um, after one year, he wants to, we'll have to change the law. It already became ordinance that the council will make that selection. And it's fine to have an advisory panel but I'm not one to shirk my responsibility in making the hard decisions. We're talking about a $5 billion project, and I think that the people's voices should be heard, and so the people's representatives should do the selection. Thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, next is uh, Gordon Lum. He's gonna speak on the congestion management system. I think well, we are dismissed. Mr. Yeah, yeah. Chairman, thank you very much.
If you look at the Federal Rules of Regulations, you're going to find this as being the definition of the congestion management process. What I need to do is translate that for you. That definition basically calls for a systematic approach. And what they're talking about with a systematic approach is some mechanism whereby the Metropolitan Plan Organization would be able to analyze a series of projects on a uniform basis and can do it consistently over and over. We also use the term required in the transportation management area. A congestion management process is required in the transportation management area. As you may recall, the trigger for a metropolitan planning organization is that an urbanized area have a population, has a population of at least 50,000. There are certain urbanized areas with a population of over 200,000. Those urbanized areas are called transportation management areas. There are two urbanized areas in the state of Hawaii, Honolulu and Kailua Kaneohe. Honolulu has a population of, as of the 2005 census, 716,000 people. So we qualify as a transportation management area. As such, we are required to have a congestion management uh, process. In terms of providing for effective management and operation, what they're talking about here is that there is a need for the process, the metropolitan plan process, to be able to come up and describe to our policy committee members uh, what basically gives the biggest bang for the bucks in terms of what is effective. Now, in terms of this management and operation, we're not really talking about some of the detailed analysis with regards to a particular project. We're talking in terms of, with regards to the documents that we produce, the transportation program, the regional transportation plan, we're trying to decide of those particular projects, which ones should be considered. Which one basically would have the biggest bang for its buck? Something that will be able to describe the projects in a collective manner. And based upon a cooperative, developed, and implemented metropolitan-wide strategy. What they're getting at here is basically that this congestion management process is developed um, through this technical process of the metropolitan planning process. That our participating agencies, the state and um, city transportation and planning departments basically participate in this particular process. For new and existing transportation facilities, we have projects which are coming out of the metropolitan planning organization through our transportation equipment program, through our regional transportation plan. Some of these projects are new, so it has to be evaluated through this congestion management plan process. If you look at our website, wahoompo.org, wahoompo.org, you'll find that we have certain documents, and these three documents are located on our website. And they basically describe the congestion management uh, process a little bit more in detail. We have the procedures and responsibilities report, which basically defines what, con what we can assume to be congestion, and identifies the procedures and responsibilities for those people, agencies that are involved in developing the analysis that goes into the congestion management uh, process. We also have a performance monitoring evaluation plan. And basically, this identifies the uh, measures of performance as well as how we calculate these measures of performance. And I'll go into that in a little bit of detail later on. And a state of congestion for on Oahu, which base, basically provides a baseline for congestion. Now, why do we do it? We do it for several reasons, but the, the main reason why we develop this congestion management program is so that when our policy committee members have to act on our transportation program, on our region transportation plan, they have one technical analysis that provides them with uh, rationale as to which project is effective with regards to congestion. Now, the policy committee uses many factors in deciding what should be included into the transportation program. This congestion management process is basically just one of those components. There are many other important components, such as public involvement. What does the public think about a particular project? There could be a project that is um, that has a very is very effective with regards to congestion mitigation. But what might be just as important would be does the public also support it? So this congestion management process is not geared to provide all of the answers. It's geared just to provide 
one part of the picture for the policy committee. What does it look like with regards to congestion mitigation? And it's not defined to be a definitive, uh, all-encompassing answer. It's just one aspect of this technical picture of congestion. Now, how do we apply it? Well, first of all, we use our travel forecasting models in order to come up with some of the analysis to evaluate some of these projects. Now, clearly, there, are, there might be some other better methods in terms of uh, analyzing projects. But with regards to cost, with regards to resources, we do not have an unlimited amount of resources in order to perform these analysis that must be done every time the transportation program is uh, amended, developed, or whenever we develop the regional transportation plan. We need a tool that we have readily available that we have sunk in some resources that can provide some of this analysis. We also have to use performance measures in order to quantify in a systematic way how these projects perform. And in terms of these performance measures, um, and this is where the, um, the no dose should be passed around. <laughs> Our technical advisory committee is basically responsible for this. So, you know, they're, they, they have great interest in this, and I'm not gonna assume that you share the same interest, but in order to understand what the congestion management process is, you should understand that we do have performance measures that are used to evaluate these particular projects. Change in volume to capacity ratio. As we all know, a certain roadway has a certain capacity. As we put more roads, uh, more cars into that particular roadway, the uh, the volume comes closer and closer to the capacity. As you come closer to the capacity, we know that the congestion level increases. So we use this as a measure of what kind, uh, how a particular project may impact congestion. List of congested roadways. As I indicated earlier, one of our reports identifies congestion. In our travel forecasting models, we've identified uh, which roadways are gonna be congested level of service EF, basically on a grading system of A, B's being good, EF's being bad. If a particular project is located on a congested roadway, we, we assume that that would make the situation better, that a project that's gonna improve the, the congested roadway is desirable from a congestion point of view. Transit mode share, uh, one of the, one of the uh, focus of this, the, new federal legislation is to try to decrease single occupant vehicles. So we included a measure where the transit mode share is an indicator of this attractiveness of a particular project to reduce this um, single occupant vehicle uh, volume. Also, vehicle volumes. We know that if a particular project is going to carry more vehicles, then we assume that that's gonna be advantageous to the public. Bigger project will be able to carry more product, right, more vehicles, so it will be perceived to be uh, more beneficial. Then we have vehicle miles traveled, vehicle hours traveled, uh, vehicle hours of delay. Uh, they're basically defined in these particular terms. Uh, it's numbers that are generated from the our forecasting models. Vehicle miles traveled, vehicle hours traveled, vehicle hours of delay. Um, I don't want to read that, but you basically have a concept of uh, what they're trying to get at. On the transit side, we also have transit projects. So what we try to do there is also provide performance measures for the transit side. And as you can see, some of these measures are identical to the highway performance measures. And we use this basically the same definition. In terms of evaluating a project, what we do is we run it through our computers and then rank it in accordance with um, a series of points which are assigned to how they perform with regards to these performance measures. For instance, um, change in the VOC ratio, I don't know if you can see it, but um, what I'll do is identify that if the change in VOC ratio increases, no points are given to a particular pro to that particular project. Uh, if there's no change in the VOBC ratio, we give it two points. If it decreases, we give it five points. If it's a new project, 
gets automatically three points. And then we also assign points for, again, all the other measures so that we will be able to quantify in a single number um, how it performs with regards to congestion. And again, these measures, these values are subjective with regards to a particular process. But in order to make it consistent, we have to assign values. What I'd like to do is to identify what we had done with regards to the 2006-2008 Transportation Equipment Program. We had to apply this congestion management process to all of our documents. And I'm using this as an example because there are certain cases here that I want to sort of highlight. We had certain projects that we analyzed, and these were the projects that we analyzed. And for one reason or another, some projects were not modeled. Uh, some of them uh, because we did not have the details at that time or that uh, the funds were already encumbered in prior year. As a result of those projects that we did at analyze, we're able to assign a point to those particular projects. And <laughs> excuse me, sorry. What I wanted to show too is um, this particular project, C7, calculate Parkway, and it was given seven points. And as you can see, the top rated one was given 16 points. Now, one, one could argue that calculate Parkway is, is very important, that calculate Parkway may is there even more points than seven? That maybe it might be even more important than some of these other projects. This is the point I want to illustrate, that whatever process you use, there's going to be limitations. Uh, the reason why Copley Parkway is rated lower than what is what intuitively you'd think it'd be rated is because it's just a small segment to the total Copley Parkway project. So with regards to the congestion management process, you know, one could say, well, Maybe we should have included the whole project in order to truly capture the, the value of that particular component. But if we did that, then where do you draw the line? What interchange do you do the entire freeway system? So, so what I'm trying to get at here is that there are limitations to this congestion management process in terms of the value. So looking at it, face value, uh, we have to be able to identify you know, what are the constraints, what are the limitations. And again, this is just one aspect. This is just one tool. This is just one factor that the policy committee uses in order to decide what projects to place in the regional transportation yeah, plan or the transportation plan program. That there are other factors that, that are involved, such as public involvement. And the congestion management uh, process is applied only to those projects that have congestion mitigation potential. There are clearly other projects that are under consideration by the policy committee. For instance, safety projects. A safety project may not have any uh, congestion mitigation value whatsoever, but with regards to importance, some of those projects may be more important than a congestion mitigation project. A bikeway project may not have an impact with regards to congestion. Second access. Sometimes we'll have congestion mitigation measures if it's gonna provide another access route, but its true value isn't to provide congestion relief, more a second access. So again, this is just one tool that is used by the policy committee that we present to the policy committee when they deliberate on a particular um, document that we have. Charles, is that um, sort of expected? Okay, I think we covered well. Uh, can we go on to the next thing? Is there any more questions? Uh, okay. I, okay, Dale, and then we'll get to you. Uh, I guess we are under time constraints, so yeah. I would like to know whether or not, uh, how we can uh, make comments or make questions because of the time constraints. Uh, you have your comments now, but why don't you give it to us? Oh, well, I, you know, 1991 was when I see required the CMS, and then it became uh, something optional. But until 2006, when the FTA and FHWA did the certification of AMPO, 
they were almost decertified because they did not have it. And one of the problems with what uh, he is telling us and the uncle process is that the I have looked at their reports and the CMS reports are sort of superficial because number one, the um, level of service is described as E or F. If you look at RTPs throughout the country, they actually give you travel times and as a single rating. So my question is, as far as you're saying that this is for the Alpo Policy Committee, the point is that the citizens do not really understand that our uh, CMS is really behind times. We do not have segment by segment travel time. We do not have the, he's saying that we don't have money, but the point is that this was supposed to be an option that was supposed to be done. And this comparison doesn't, just let me finish this one. And the one point is that we in Honolulu have a severe road deficit. So when you're looking at CMS and looking at the grades, it isn't right to say that, oh, well, we can't, we have this and that when you haven't even factored in the part that we are already road deficient. So I'm just suggesting that um, we have more discussion okay, so that the we'll have more discussion on this thing. I, I can give a response. Yeah, all right, all right. Back in 1991, it was true that it was required to have a metropolitan plan organization that qualified as a teammate was required to have a congestion management system, which was later turned to a congestion management process. Because the process relied upon using uh, participating agencies, the city and state transportation departments, and because they were the ones who basically had the technical capabilities to actually do the analysis, to collect travel time data, to, to do this particular analysis, our process basically said that, okay, we rely upon DOT and DTS to work on it in order to uh, develop this process for us. And I think my understanding was that the state DOT was taking lead on this particular effort. I said, fine, let us know what you're gonna do, we'll work with you. We work with them, work with them, nothing happened. So finally, we decided we just can't wait any longer. My staff came up with a mechanism whereby we will be able to qualify for satisfying the condition management system at that particular moment. Some areas do collect travel time surveys in terms of trying to figure out what is the actual travel time on a particular segment. And we had done that uh, for 1991, 1992, possibly 1990 also. And when we did that, we could only do it for certain segments of the roadways because it's very expensive. What you basically have to do is get a person to drive a car and throw that car into a stream every 15 minutes in order to get an accurate assessment of where the travel time peaks are and what the travel time um, profiles are. And at one time, we even hired um, the Hawaii Bicycle League in order to collect this information because they were using it as a fundraiser. But even then, it was very, very expensive and we could not cover all of our roadways. For the value that we had uh, for the limitations on our staff, we have a forecasting model that can also generate travel time surveys. Travel times. And that's what we use in order to evaluate these particular roadways. Now, a travel forecasting model is is not going to give you an accurate, 100% accuracy because nothing will give you 100% accuracy. Even travel time surveys where you throw a car into the, a roadway stream will not give you 100% accuracy because it's variation throughout the day, through the seasons, and as we all know, summer, summer months vary dramatically from the non-summer months. So as a result of that, we do have a congestion management process and this process has been approved by the Federal Highway Administration, Federal Transit Administration, and we are certified. We were never in a position where we were gonna be decertified. There are three conditions, or three status, or three levels that you could uh, obtain. One, that you qualify as part of all of your requirements, you satisfy all of the federal requirements. Two, you significantly qualify under those particular requirements, but you have corrective actions in terms of what's needed in order to bring you up. And then three, you do not qualify. During the time of the uh, 
the congestion management system process, we are under the significantly uh, comply with, but with corrected actions. One of those corrected actions was basically to provide for the development of this congestion management system. We were recently certified again in 2007, and that 2007 certification basically says that we, we comply with all the requirements. So this is a certified process. Your question. Identify yourself. Albert, um, downtown resident. I spent a lot of time driving around town as a real estate broker. I looked at the management analysis. There's hundreds of roads that are included in this analysis. It seems like every road is congested. I have a couple of questions. So it doesn't look like there's any of them that are prioritized. Roads like um, Pecoy, Halakea, these kind of roads that are constant, Board Avenue, constantly active. I want to get the traffic to their destination highways, Holly, Leaky, Leaky, around here. The management analysis doesn't prioritize them. I didn't see them on the analysis. And then also, and why is the question. And then the second question is, why can't they have a, a real-time system that uses satellite data or cameras that can spot the cars on the road? It's an archaic system. One of the system. reasons why we had uh, gone with the, originally we wanted travel time surveys, and we were going to use intelligent transportation <coughs> systems technology in order to get that. But at that time, that was not available. Uh, you are correct in terms of uh, identifying that there are congestion points throughout the entire area. One of the problems that we have right now is that we do not have the monies to really provide congestion relief throughout the island. We, are, we have to look at other alternatives. Um, Representative Cabanella, for instance, is looking at me means of finding additional revenues through tolling. You know, she has proposed um, several projects such as tolling on some highways, Pearl Harbor Tunnel, and these are mechanisms whereby additional revenues could be provided. We do not have the monies to address all of these congestion issues, so we have to try to look at other innovative mechanisms whereby some of these um, projects, the needed projects, can be can be addressed. With regards to priorities, if you look at our regional transportation plan, we recognize that we do have a limitation with regards to uh, our ability to address congestion because of limited funds, limited resources. But based upon where we identify our second city, where we Partnership guidelines was presented to the policy committee by um, your chair, and the policy committee accepted that reminder. Um, a request to the policy committee to urge the Senate Transportation Committee to hold a hearing on House Bill 70, House Draft Number 3, was also presented by your chair. Um, it was heard by the policy committee. Although um, Well, there's, let me just, oh, sure. okay, um, there's a handout here, and it's an explanation from uh, Senator English why he is not here told. And um, I suggest you read it, and we'll go into it at a later meeting. Um, the reasons he gave, uh, there was a submittal to the uh, House of Representatives uh, Research Section, uh, Majority le uh, Section, and they said uh, the reasons he gave was not very good. In fact, uh, there was no basis for it. Uh, that was that. And then uh, we asked uh, that a member of the CAC chair would sit on the policy committee. Uh, that was turned down, but... Um, they said they will hear us, so we'll be put on the agenda. And so that, that was essentially, um, oh, there were some other things, but uh, of time restrained. What was their reasons for not getting the CAC chair? Um, I think uh, they felt uh, like the neighborhood boards, uh, they don't have, uh, they don't sit everybody on uh, on the neighborhood board, so they felt since the policy committee, um, even though uh, he would be a non-voting person, 
they didn't feel that they would go along with it. I'm not sure the reasons. Uh, you, the the way that I heard it was like, we are us, but you are them. <laughs> really? Yeah, that's a good reason, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> You're only the Tom. Uh, Chair, may I offer some comment for a, a consolidated approach? And that is, is that because the identification was a bill number, House Bill 70, it threw off, from my perspective, I brought my camera, just like this woman here. I brought my camera, and I was the only camera in the room. And what I had listened to over and over and over, listening to what the policy said to uh, Mr. Carroll giving the recommendations by this CAC. Chair, would you please entertain for a future approach whereby instead of labeling it with a bill number, which was precedence, mm -hmm. that's what threw them off. Would you please consider saying the following? Instead of saying House Bill 70, would you entertain with your committee here, um, please, policy committee, have a task force meeting or a uh, in investigative approach towards public-private partnerships. Well, if somebody would like to make a motion that we consider it at the next meeting, maybe consider the make them cons uh, present to the policy committee that they consider public and private partnership. Period. The concept of it, and we can bring it up again at their next meeting. Without, without mentioning a bill number, right, of which right. what they, that's what they objected to, a yeah. bill number. Can we also further, since I was the one who, I still don't understand why they said no. I'd like at some future time to have some clarifications. For okay. Yeah. Yeah. I can provide it now. Oh, okay. Uh, no, with regards to the um, CAC sitting on the uh, As a non-voting member. Yeah. CAC as a non-voting member. Non yeah. non um, what the, there were three people who spoke, and I believe one, the chairman had basically said that um, um, that the CC is already able to participate in discussions with policy committees, and he recommended, as a result of that, that the CAC be placed on all of the policy committee's agenda, and that the CAC representative or its chair uh, report those activities so that they would basically have a voice at the policy committee meeting. Uh, I believe uh, there was another person, too, that also mentioned that chair also has the discretion to invite people to sit on the table. He already has that discretion. So there was no real need for the policy committee to vote on it. So the voice of the Citizens Advisory Committee will be heard at each meeting and it will be presented, at least from my perspective, by the CAC chair. Well, I never expected. Yeah. And there was a feeling of, of not wanting to amend the law and go through that process. It didn't have to. No, no we, we were not considering that going, uh, being a voting member. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Chair, uh, can I make a statement? It's just a two, two sentences. I found that any time you have a public-private partnership, the public always gets to be uh, the junior partner. And this is uh, my... Uh, I, just uh, what happens is the big boys on Fisher Street okay. end up having control of everything. Okay, thank you. Chair, um, yeah. I'm not sure if this has been taken off the agenda or you want to add No, to that's going to be added on. It's not even on the agenda. Yeah, next time. Uh, yeah well, I, I, that's the point. Uh, I will get to that point. Uh, asking that it be put on the agenda for next time for discussion and for voting. Following up on Tom Berg's uh, suggestion, I'd like to uh, make the motion with the addition of PPP and TOE. So second the motion. Okay, we can call it. Uh, what purpose of? We can take that up at the next meeting yeah. in December well, the 19th. You asked 19th, for the uh, motion, right? Yeah, 19. Okay. Um, You've got a motion in a second? Yeah. No, okay. Uh, well, let's have everybody seen a copy of this. Uh, it's asking for a uh, H1 corridor study. Uh, I would like to have it taken up at the next meeting and voted. So moved, Mr. Chair. 
I second that with reservation of that. Yes. Okay. But I mean, it should at least be heard. Right. Yeah. Can I make a, uh, uh, a comment? Okay. Comment. I just would like to uh, have Mr. Lamb read his report to the along with his uncle regarding the uh, feedback on the Federal Highway uh, that you wrote in the report. Could you just read that for that? that the policy committee is not adhering to public comment. They got critiqued and criticized. That's what I believe she's asking. If you could please read that one sentence in that Federal Highways report. That way it's in the minutes. Just read the first section. We have two motions on the table right now. Yeah, let's on the table, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, this has been first, it uh, has been second, uh, has Put on it's been, it's been second. I, second, I second it with reservations. Reservation. Yeah, I know. Well, we'll go on with this. Which agenda? Today or the next, next, next meeting? Next meeting. Next meeting. So all in favor of uh, having this put on the agenda for the next meeting? With reservations. With reservations. Res res <laughs> <laughs> First reading. That's okay. how I look at it. Yeah. And the second, thing, and the second motion, uh, motion that's being discussed then is uh, uh, putting it back well, to the policy committee, uh, just mentioning public and private partnerships and tolls. Is is that acceptable? Is so? I want to make a motion on that. I did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're a second. Okay. <coughs> so uh, we have a vote then. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Those Abstain. <laughs> you second it. <laughs> as long as I don't vote. Yeah. Okay. Abstain. <laughs> Chair, for clarification, you have three abstains. Does the motion pass? December 19th. Um, this material has been given. This is a, a preview of what will be discussed. So, uh, and also, uh, I want to ask you. Could you read what, the, what will be on the December 19th? Fruitless. Yeah. Oh, that, one. that thing, yeah. <laughs> It'll be on uh, transit oriented development. Scott? Mr. Chair, I'm a little confused about our role, as has been questioned uh, in this letter to us from Senator English. So would it be possible for Mr. Lum to, to, to clarify for us or some, uh, maybe the next meeting, just this one sentence, the UNPO Policy Committee should show restraint by refusing to interfere with the legislative process and allow the bill to be considered at the appropriate time in the appropriate way, if at all. Um, I did not know that we should show restraint by refusing to interfere with the legislative process. And so if, if you could help educate us in the next meeting whether we are to advise on that or we are to show the restraint, that might help us to know what we're here for. Yes. Also, Mr. Chair, Rich King of the Pacific Resource Partnership, we have some uh, we have some material as far as public-private partnerships that may be predisposed for or against. Uh, you know. So, are we also uh, will we will be will be allowed to present additional materials as far as uh, public partnerships uh, at the next meeting for everybody to review? I mean, okay. That again, I still want to clarify whether the rules will accept that to an extent. I will clarify that. Yeah. Why don't you uh, is that, that open to other people, other groups, or is it just yes. the Well, let oh, Marion check. I need to look at the bylaws. Yeah, let, let her look in the bylaws. Then we'll I mean, in this case, what we have is materials presented. So at least for this one instance, mm -hmm. in, in fairness, 
other groups should be able to prevent their viewpoints. Even if it was incorrect in this instance, for purposes of fairness, it should be allowed at least once. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair? Yes? Uh, Frank? Regarding the December meeting, uh, uh, who will make the presentation on talk, Mr. Burton? Yes. Uh, I have a question regarding then the next meeting. Can I propose that the agenda for January, since we've listened to well, the new concept, uh, well, I'm going to need time. May I ask the question? Oh, I'll put it on December if you want to put it on December. Yeah, put it on December. Uh, no, no, I, like I meant you yeah. can ask the question in December. What's the no, no, I'd like to ask the question now because oh, it'll take ahead. some preparation. Quick, quick. We've listened to other technologies. What about a rail technology? I would need some time to uh, get a speaker, but I would like to have somebody discuss the latest rail technology. And I'd like to see that on the agenda for the talk. Can that be put? I mean, the CAC. Can that? Be I move that that be included. In yeah. The okay. Second. For what? For which meeting? I don't know yet. You'll yeah. first have to find out if you got if you, when you can get your speaker. I can. I can. I need. I need okay. a little time, but I can get one. I'm sure for January. Well, okay. You can call me up. Or you can call. Uh, can we clarify on. the motion at the earliest possible time? Okay. All right. Right. With reservation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Can one more comment? Excuse me. I mean, I got, I got a, have a chance to say something. If we're going to have TOD in the next meeting, the negative aspect, why can't we have the positive aspect of TOD in the next one also? Why can't we have the city DPP who. We can make it? No, no, no. Wait, wait. Because all we're doing, we're getting negative stuff. Let's have both sides of the story so we can make a decision. Well, the other meetings, you know. No, January, but I'd like to have it at the same one in December. Well, in the no, and when we heard the talk, the other side wasn't able to present any information because we used up all the time. We just I had a meeting in White Pablo that they presented the TOD, and Tom was talking. there. I know that. I, 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 I like both sides. Well, we have a, we have other meetings that we can ha uh, carry on both sides. Well, I just want the people to hear yes. this to hear <coughs> also Again, the positive side at the, the same time. Chair, this suggests another agenda, possible, uh, another possible motion that can be made whenever possible. Both sides of any issue should yeah. be presented. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <Yeah. the> <laughs> okay. We do have to get out here at 5 o'clock, and it's getting close to that. Got a minute. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, anything else? Uh, yeah, I just want to say that it's sort of disrespectful to not have done what uh, Representative Campanella asked, just to read one sentence or whatever. I mean, the whole thing is that this committee should be able to listen to all sides. And so I would suggest that he be able to do that then. Okay. Yeah. Very quickly, Chair, thank you for recognizing me. I believe Scott Belford made a very poignant point. My only point of making my comment to be recognized is that I hope Scott Belford's comment is entered in the minutes for the record for all time in memorial. Thank you. Chair. Yes. Since the name Senator Jay Kalani English been bandied around at least two or three times, let me say this. As one of the three court chairs that decided on the Senate side on the super fair issue. He voted against it, but he released his committee as did the chair of a second committee. And as you know, the super fair bill did pass. So okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right, uh, meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Uh, we must vacate. <laughs> Come on, no talk. No talk. We have head shaking. No talk. I know you were so That's right. That's what we're doing. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Slide him down, please. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I get it. What? What? Working hard. See ya. I can't. Oh, it's right on the table. Thank you. Yeah, I might pay. Right. Yeah, you too. Okay. Thank you, Paul. No. You guys say this uh, forever from time to time. Oh my goodness. Poignant <laughs> <laughs> point. I like that. Too. You got to. You got to. Well, if you don't say it, it goes you from which she's got to do. Right? Yeah. She's doing for it. Thank you, Anita. Thank Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Okay. No, it's not going to be a struggle. Because it's a lie.
Here's what happens. In the past, a bill was only to bring a cap number on board. And it got defeated because they said, wait a minute, that's numbers. an even number. That's, that's why it's an odd So it's easy to say, see ya. See ya. They can flush it down the toilet. So it's easy to see. Right, thanks. Yeah. Okay. So she's going to have to. If we get the bottom, the bottom is out of the room.